good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. And welcome, welcome to Humanizing Software, episode 58, where the Tailwind team has the opportunity to interact with a number of men and women leaders in technology, in business and economics from all different walks of life, from literally every corner of the world about this concept known as humanizing software, where we take this idea of technology interacting in our lives in so many different ways and break it down a little bit to figure out with all of the ever-changing and ever-present nuances and subtleties that impact us from a morning to an evening aspect, how do we make sure that we keep the humans in as part of this conversation. We're gonna have that conversation today with somebody who happens to be a very, very good friend of mine, and I'm extremely excited to have on and join us today. But before I do, I wanna make mention, please join us in on the conversation. Visit our website at tailwindsw.com. Join the conversation on LinkedIn, on Twitter, or X as the case may be now, uh, any of the other social media channels where we are, and follow us on our YouTube channel where we have each of the previous 57 episodes of Humanizing Software and listen and learn to a variety of different leaders with their own opinions and perspectives about where we are, but most importantly, where we want to be. I particularly enjoyed our last episode with Jim Bledsoe a few weeks back, uh, where we covered off a wide range of topics. And next week, we'll have Randy Merriweather join us with his thoughts and opinions as well. But today, I'm extremely excited to have somebody join us who I'm not sure where the conversation's going to go, and that's what makes it equally exciting. Doug Bain will be joining us shortly. And let me tell you a little bit about Doug before he does join us. Doug is an experienced growth leader and management consultant who focuses primarily on healthcare. He has led the growth function, and that includes everything from sales and marketing, client success, revenue operations, from the smallest of mid-sized companies to mid-market private equity portfolio companies to folks that are in the Fortune 5 or 10. This range has given Doug a unique perspective and ability to make sure that different types of companies are able to break through their particular growth ceilings and challenges. Doug is particularly passionate about bringing new innovations to market and to broader audiences, something that we'll be talking about today, especially as it pertains to the healthcare system. That is something that is near and dear to my own heart. Um, Doug has grown up in Oregon, is, lives here in Austin, and he'll tell us a little bit about his family. So I'd like to have everybody please join us in welcoming Doug Bain to the conversation today. Doug, good morning. Good morning, Andrew. How are you? I am very, very well. I get to have a Doug and Andrew conversation. What possibly could All be right. better? <laughs> I've been excited. Peak, as big as you can get. I, 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 I'm, I'm ex excited on this on a number of different fronts. Um, and as we do with just about everybody, and I'm pretty sure we've done it 57 previous times, we always like to give our audience. And here's the important piece. It's not just the audience that's listening in live now, but it's the hundreds or thousands of folks that might be listening in to some, all, or part of this any time in the future, because we hmm. both know digital is forever. So Doug, tell us a little bit about the Doug Bain story. Who is Doug? Wow. I wasn't ready for that level of pressure. Um, so, uh, you know, one thing that struck me as I was thinking about, especially in this context, you know, you know, uh, innovation, technology, healthcare. So as you mentioned, I grew up in Oregon, son of a doctor. And one of my earliest impressions of how technology was advancing was my dad had one of those beepers, right? A pager. This was pre-peak pager of the early 90s. This was way back when, when not many people had it. And they made a horrible racket. <laughs> I remember being a kid, like at my recital or something like that, and hearing that thing going off in the back room and being horribly embarrassed. Um, and yet, a little bit proud too. Dad's going off to help people. So um, uh, I grew up in Oregon and uh, love the state, still kind of consider myself an Oregonian. But when the time came to spread my wings, um, I found my way um, with a fairly intentional search of a lot of different options uh, to Rice University in Houston. And that got me to Texas. And frankly, my first role in a, in, a, in a job out of school got me to Austin. And Austin was like, OK, this is the place I can stay. So I've been in Austin essentially ever since then. I 
did a little time in Dallas, but I got back. Excellent. So I want to touch base because there's a couple items that we're going to have to absolutely dive a little bit deeper on. Um, you, like me, have married substantially above your station. I mean, for me, it's stratospherically over my station. I can arguably say that that's the same thing for you. You're blessed with an, a, a wonderfully talented young man who's part of your uh, um, who's part of your world, and and yet. Um, I, I don't want to talk about those two first. I really, really need to have a conversation about your, and I need to make sure I get this correct, your part Wookiee, part Muppet, Bernadoodle named Zena. Yes. What exactly is that? <laughs> so, uh, it, 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 when you meet her, you know immediately. That is the pedigree. So she's a big floppy dog. She weighs in about a hundred pounds, but really she's just big boned. Um, and she is, as the name implies, part poodle, part Bernese mountain dog. And she flops around like a, a, a Muppet. And she is like the walking carpet uh, that you'd expect a Wookiee to be. And uh, she believes she's a little tiny puppy. So she loves to sit in your lap, even though, again, 100 pounds kind of interferes with anything you're trying to do. She's totally unaware, loves everybody, loves all dogs, loves all people. And she's a star everywhere we go. So we're going to figure out how we update the title to not only humanizing software, but humanizing with dogs software or yes, with pets right. or with animals <laughs> or something so we can be all inclusive. Um, now, I, as I was reading through, and I remembered, of course, that you guys had a dog, but I did not remember the specifics. And I don't believe I've ever seen a seven word descriptor before a dog's name. So <laughs> I actually absolutely had to bring that up. Um, you mentioned something in your upbringing. Your dad was a doctor. Mm -hmm. um, you've done a ton on the healthcare space. I get, and we've got as part of our audience that's listening in, folks that um, are, I'll loosely refer to it as our age or older. Um, experienced, perhaps in some ways. Yes. Um, and wise, we have folks that are wise. younger. Yes, wise. Yep. We'll go with wise. We mm -hmm. also have folks that are younger um, that might look at us with the quizzical pager. You said pager. What exactly is pager? <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, which has been brought up numerous times in the past. Yet, I want to actually speak to something that's more important. You mm -hmm. both had a sense of slight annoyance, but a little bit of pride because your dad had a piece of technology, essentially telco technology, but it was able to let him know that he was needed to go help people. Technology enabling the helping of folks. Yep. That had to have some pretty significant impact on you as you were figuring out your path to Texas, your path to Rice, your path through the various companies that you've been a part of. Let's talk a little bit about that. Where has, what is the impact of family? Because I know this is extremely important uh, to you. What has that had really to your overall job composition and outlook? You know, it's interesting. I, um, as I was trying to figure out what I wanted to be when I grew up, when I was, uh, you know, looking at college and all that sort of stuff, I, somewhere in there decided I really, I wanted to be a doctor. And interestingly enough, at that time, of all people, my dad tried to talk me out of it. Um, he was experiencing the beginnings of radical change in the healthcare system. He was a primary care provider when he started out, and he he, he did everything. He was a, they, used, they used to be called general practitioners because they really did everything. He delivered several of my friends. Uh, he uh, you know did minor surgery there in his office. Um, and just took care of, uh, you know, a, 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 a panel of patients. Um, and but he saw how things were changing and he saw that it was getting more and more difficult. And there are more different entities uh, getting sort of in the middle of people's practices. And like a lot of doctors felt like it was interfering with his relationship with his patient and his ability to practice. Um, so he thought as a you know, as a, a way to make a living as a job, um, you know, you you would be losing a lot of the sort of joy and um, and and sort of fulfillment that he was getting from it, and it was just going to be more of a struggle with bureaucracy and with uh, and with different types of regulatory entities and insurance companies and stuff. Um, and sadly, all that's come true. Um, 
you know, we have as a country, um, I don't think by design, but certainly by neglect, of, we've gutted the primary care ranks in this country, um, which if we're looking for somebody who can guide patients to the best resources, that is the, 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 the correct place to go. And we have fewer and fewer. And I think people don't realize just what a crisis we have looming in front of us. So you just touched on one of my, and I apparently have lots of flashpoints. Um, we'll just touch on this particular flashpoints. Um, I am, uh, and I think I share this with a lot of different folks, very, very frustrated with the state of healthcare um, in, in the country today. Um, we went through COVID um, that darn near decimated um, uh, our system and, and taxed not only the resources that we have. And when I say resources, I mean not only the hospital beds, but the entire ecosystem where you have support personnel, you have doctors, nurses, you have healthcare professionals, you have folks across the entire piece that were involved in this, in, 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 in every, this impacted everybody. And yet I'm not sure that we learned a single thing relative to the issues that we have. We make medical breakthroughs. We've got nanotechnology. We've got new drugs that are coming out on a regular basis, which seems to be kind of the American way to do things, pop a pill and hit the easy button, um, which it has its own ramifications and issues. Um, we've got new surgical devices, new medical devices, new means with which for people to have mobility. I know you've been a part of several of these companies. Technology is existing to help us be better. And yet our fundamental system in terms of if I need to seek a problem for something that is acute happening now or something that might be happening because I'm getting older and things are just breaking down. I don't feel that I've got the best options available. And I've had my own PCPs, three of them, primary care physicians, retire, go to a different practice, whatever, over the course of the last 12 to 18 months. Very, very curious to get your take, because I know I covered off a lot there. Mm -hmm. um, we've got a people problem. We've got a policy problem. We've got technology that's not being applied. You've got some passion. You've seen a lot of things that are happening in this space. <clears throat> what can we do to be better as it pertains to our healthcare system and capabilities? Um, you know, there is a lot there. Let me just start by saying, I think if you have a particular condition, you kind of within a particular space of practice, and you need the best treatment in the world, this is the country where you get that done. And that's proven out by the people who uh, have the means to do it from all over the world. They come here for those particular things, like when the chips are down. Um, but because of all the things you mentioned, the complexity, the, um, and I'll just say, you know, a part of that complexity is just vast amounts of red tape, the, the lack of accountability of long-term risk, because of all those things, uh, and because of, Look, we're a little bit victims of our own success. We do innovate incredibly well in this country. We've done a ton of innovation, innovation in healthcare. The system we have is broken. It is does support innovation through patents and through funding that can be available for that. So we get really, really good at these very specific things. Um, this can be a very difficult place to be treated if what you've got is on the borderline, if it's between multiple specialties. If there's this lack of certainty, certainty around that that diagnosis or like, where does it really fit? And uh, I've seen the system, our system, fail over and over again. Patients that are, it's a little bit vague and the handoffs are so poor. Um, and I think the relatively myopic view that hyper-specialization has brought to medicine, it's very hard to see kind of what are the other things. Again, the type of thing that a general practitioner should be there to look broadly at the patient as we're kind of bypassing that and going straight to specialists, people are people are getting in trouble. Um, in terms of you know the solutions, uh, there's so many challenges. As a friend who was in healthcare consulting for years and years told me, healthcare is the gift that keeps on giving because the problems never stop. So um, I've worked at several companies working on fixing a piece here, a piece there, a piece over there. Um, the company I'm with right now is working on fixing 
some of the most fundamental challenges were just like, how do you navigate the system? How do you get to the care you need? How do you know what it's going to cost? And how do you make sure that, um, you know, all of that works to the best advantage? We made the system so difficult to navigate. Uh, for example, there, there was a study that uh, the Stanford Business School did a couple of years ago just to see what is the impact of this difficulty in navigating. And, you know, all, essentially every time somebody tries to connect with their kind of this whole conglomerate of healthcare and benefits, getting on the phone is at least 32 minutes. So they had 32.57 minutes on average each time. And I will tell you that it takes several of those phone calls to get pretty much anything done. So just imagine that effort. And people really get stymied by that. So we, if we have that upfront obstacle to getting care, just that people are intimidated how much effort it's going to be. Um, we have the additional obstacle that people have extraordinarily high deductibles now, and essentially they're paying out of pocket without any visibility of what it's going to cost them. So that's another reason people don't seek care. So people are putting off care if it's if it's uh, not very well slotted in a particular specialty. It can be very very both costly and ineffective, um, and then just trying to coordinate all the pieces so it works easily for people, it's getting in the way of care. So it's easy to blame the insurance companies. It's easy to blame the system. It's easy to blame the individual hospitals, uh, policymakers. There's plenty of blame to go around. The interesting piece of what we've tried to talk about on each of our previous live casts isn't necessarily the problems, but maybe defining the problem statement and then figuring out how technology, in many cases, hardware or software, can be leveraged against that particular problem statement. Um, where might we start this conversation relative to the definition of a problem statement mm -hmm. of where it can really truly be started to help fix that which ails us, so to speak. Yeah. So, um, you know, our mantra at uh, Point Health Tech, our company is healthcare should be easy to understand, easy to find, and easier to afford. Um, so the problem statement is just the opposite of that, right? It's hard to find, it's hard to understand, it's very expensive. So how do we start doing that? This is really starting at this sort of member experience, this patient experience level. There are many complexities in terms of how do you best deliver treatment? How do you cure cancer? How do you solve chronic conditions? Uh, you know, we're taking sort of a fundamentalist approach to say, how do we just make this easier? So if that's our problem statement, then there's a lot of different directions you can go with potential solutions. Okay. And I, I like where you're going with that, with um, breaking it down, putting it into smaller chunks, and then figuring out different ways and means. And and and, and part of this to me, and I, I, um, I don't believe, Doug, you and I um, are going to solve healthcare uh, today. Um, we, we, we can talk about it a little bit. We might be able to- Get a some. little bit more time. <laughs> I love it. Um, everybody out there listening from a policymaker perspective, let's- <laughs> fix this somehow. Look. Let's, let's, let's make it easier. Um, and, and, and I'll use a great example. Here, here's a fantastic example. Um, I, in order to get something solved, if you've got a healthcare issue, call your PCP, get an appointment. If it's remotely related to a specialist, then you get to make an appointment with a specialist. And then hopefully you can get a diagnosis. You can get something which is probably going to potentially at least involve medication or something else. But it seems like it's you're you're entering into the same mousetrap spiral. It's interesting because my oldest daughter told me, and I was all in on this, um, uh, about Amazon trying to upset the apple cart on the healthcare side and how easy it was for her with getting an appointment, doing telehealth, getting it resolved in 15 minutes, but she was able to do, get online with somebody, have an interaction, have that interaction result in something that was positive that then resulted in her being able to take and get a solution taken into place. So take the dad way of 
yeah, I'm going to see a, I'm going to see a guy and I'm going to see another guy and I'm going to see another lady and we'll see another lady. And then in about five weeks, I'm going to have something taken care of. My very tech hip daughter, hip tech daughter, whatever the hell that, whatever that means <laughs> says, Hey dad, I had a problem. I solved it in about 20 minutes. Yeah. And that to me, and I'm like, Hey, I want that. I, 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 and I'm not all about the easy button, but I am kind of about the easy button. As long as it yep. removes the red tape, as long as it removes extra steps, as long as it removes the onus or the pain that is involved in me or you okay. as the patient that has to go through so many different traps, much yep. less the myriad number of paperwork that you get to sign of, yep. hey, by the way, come in 20 minutes early to your appointment, <laughs> maybe 30 minutes early. Because yeah. we can have the you read through and sign twenty different documents. Right. Thank goodness we've got and portals. handwrite a lot of information that they already have in their system. Again. Yes. Thank sure. goodness. Who, want, who doesn't want to do that? Yeah. Yeah. I want to take three <laughs> hours out of my day to take care of it. Right. Um, but thank goodness there's mm -hmm. portals where mm -hmm. you can, and many of them are becoming more advanced to support autofill, and they do actually leverage mm -hmm. the intaking of information. And I understand more than most the walls that are purposefully put up because of HIPAA relative to privacy and healthcare that not mm -hmm. everybody needs to know my stuff. Nobody needs to know your stuff. But again, the technology lives to exist where we can make a three hour or a five week process become something that can be 20 or 30 minutes. Yeah. Where or how can we take this a step further, a step faster? Uh, well, exactly right. And your daughter's experience had a similar experience too. It's like there, there's so many faster ways to get this done and more efficient ways to get this done. And we are working on that. So when you're talking about these kind of lower level, I got something, I need to talk to a doctor, get it fixed, move on. There are, that is getting better. And frankly, some of that uh, pace of innovation was accelerated by the pandemic, which forced states and medical associations and lots of others to drop the barriers against telemedicine to like let that actually do what it should be doing make that all more efficient um sadly some of those barriers have started to come up on a regulatory basis so i hope they stay down uh but you know for example if you want to be in sort of the the, the tele behavioral health business um you still have to have people in every single state because you can't talk to a doctor in another state really. So there's a lot of those sorts of challenges, but there are getting to be technological and process ways around that to make that more efficient. Um, that doesn't solve our biggest crisis. And our biggest crisis is ultimately a cost crisis, right? So right now, the average, well, I want to say that right now, last year, the average uh, cost of a uh, ACA program. So if the Affordable Care Act type of healthcare plan was um, for an individual was a little over $8,000 a year. Wow. So consider that the median income for an individual in the US is about 37. You're really asking people to spend a third of their income on insurance. And most of those people never use their insurance because the deductible is so high. So you're asking them to pay a lot of money for something they don't use. And the only way that's tolerable, the only way that works in any market whatsoever is that it's subsidized. So, which it is, it's subsidized either by the, your employer or it's subsidized by the government. And it's very easy the way that process works to lose track of the fact that your employer is paying 30% of what your salary would have been to cover the healthcare costs. Right. So if you're upset with your level of your income, there's 30 percent just sitting there because this problem has been solved so poorly. So, again, go back to the fundamental question. If you're talking about, you know, can we make it a smoother and better experience? Yes, we're trying to accomplish that, too, with helping to navigate through. But we're also trying to take a look at next chunk up of expenses. So all of those procedures that you could get done. The biggest challenge of those procedures in terms of from a pure cost perspective is that um, you don't know what it's going to cost you. It's incredibly hard to find out what it's going to cost you. 
you don't know what the quality of any particular provider hospital is. So if you're concerned about, well, I don't want to get the knee redone, let's just do it once. You want to go to the highest quality. It's incredibly hard to find that stuff out. And what people don't realize is they know that pricing may vary a little bit, right? You think about car might cost a little more over here than there. That's a major expense. Surely you would know that. Um, we're asking everybody to just basically take on blind faith that, you know, that's the right price. Nobody knows that that price varies not only just by a few percentage points, by 100%, 200%, 800%. We see this all the time, that the price of a procedure in one location versus another in the same town, sometimes across the street, eight times difference in price. So Hi. if you consider, I mean, and, and this is everybody is not able to shop. They aren't aware of that. So there's all of this, what you have to believe is excess cost because they're not getting any higher quality for eight times the more cost. If they could shop, they probably wouldn't select that. But since they can't, there's a lot of money going that way. So it's hard to define just how what percentage of that $8,000 everybody's paying as an individual every single year goes to that sort of inefficient marketplace. But it's certainly not insubstantial. I had no idea that it could be one, two, four, or eight X um, uh, of the cost associated with it. <clears throat> it speaks to inefficiencies and it speaks to the fact that um, obviously we have so much more, so much more work to do uh, relative yep. to this. Switching and gears. Oh, go ahead. I'm just going to say, just to add to that, this is where, and maybe this is where you're going, but this is where technology can come, come to bear, right? I literally was saying switching gears. <laughs> Birds of Do we family. know each other or what? Exactly. <laughs> Here we're going into this. All right. Well, I'll save so, you the trouble. <laughs> so ahead. you you have experienced, you've interacted with, you've brought to market, you've helped bring to market a ton of cool technological innovations and not just healthcare, other different types of things I've seen throughout your career, a lot that were really, really cool. A couple that may have been a little bit before their time, but now are probably more in their prime time, um, but a wide variety. You pick, Doug, from your experience, what has been a great technology adjustment improvement mechanism. And oh, by the way, let's think of also picking one that was perhaps not the best technology improvement mechanism. Mm -hmm. You pick, good or bad, what, maybe, maybe I get both. one of each. Yeah, one of each to start off with. And <laughs> let's 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 walk through what was it, what kind of impact did it have? And this is literally getting to the heart of the matter of technology having an impact on society. Yeah. Thoughts and comments. Yeah, you bet. You know, um, so one that I'll talk about that I that was great at the time. So this is going back away. So this is going back into the into the aughts, um, maybe the late nineties, probably into the aughts. Uh, I was working for a very large pharmacy benefit manager. And uh, the one thing that's an advantage when you look at pharmacy data compared to medical data, when you're looking at it from the processing of all that data gets churned together where it all meets is in claims. Medical claims are incredibly messy. They're all over the place. They're submitted in different formats. Pharmacy claims are very structured, right? Because it has to be processed at the pharmacy while you're standing right there. So for that to work, they had to be agreed upon kind of all the data about the person and about the, 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 the medications were all in nice little tight little columns. Um, and we started pushing on what can we do with this data? What are we able to do? Just say, look, medical data is kind of a mess. What can we do with just the pharmacy data more than just get pharmacy, get drugs shipped out and paid for? And we started to look at, um, we can look at this and by looking at this data, we can kind of figure out well, what's the condition they're being treated for. Then we can look at other things in that person's profile and say, wait, they're being treated for this condition too. So standard, standard pharmacy analysis says that if you take this drug and this drug, that's bad. What we are doing the next level is saying, we're gonna infer a disease here and then infer a disease here and say, if they have this, they probably shouldn't be taking this. Let's get ahead of that. We could also tell things like adherence. So somebody, I mean, it's it's alarming to think how many people that have had a transplant of a significant organ, 
a liver, a kidney, something like that. And they have to be on medications the rest of their life to keep it from self-rejecting. The people that stop taking the medication, it's an alarming number. And so we got in, developed this system and a process where we could reach out and uh, let the doctor know this appears to be the situation. We didn't come to the conclusion. We gave the data to the doctor to come to the conclusion because that the doctor owns that patient relationship so they could get that patient out of, out of risk. So technically, very, very successful. Um, market wise, not so successful. Why? I mean, one of the reasons was you're working with people on could be longer term conditions, longer term uh, risks. And the fact of the matter is people change health plans every about 18 months, I think it is now, whether they're at the same employer or not. And then they also, as we know, people in changing employers much more frequently than they used to. So nobody owns that long term risk. So paying this extra money for this extra analysis that has to go in to get this person out of this risk, there's not necessarily a straight ROI for that, for whoever's paying the bill, usually the employer or the health plan. So from a market perspective, there's things that could get done, but the system doesn't align with, doesn't align the incentives. That, <clears throat> I had no idea thinking about the subtle nuances of that, just with the freedom of choice causing additional friction inside of the system, which is adding the friction equals cost. Yeah. Interesting. Yep. And that was back, um, we're talking, sounds like 25 years ago. Um, well, let's say 10, 15, but yeah. Okay. Quite okay. a while ago. So, so again, so things have advanced dramatically from there and probably the cost of doing that same sort of work has happened there, but we still have this fundamental obstacle in the market, which is, you know, who's willing to pay for that effort because it's going to be some other health plan, who benefit, health plan who financially benefits from that person's better health, and you're, you know, you want to, uh, you know, appeal to all of our better natures that that's a worthwhile thing. That doesn't always pass muster when people are taking a pencil to the budgets of what they're already spending on healthcare. So totally get the value proposition there, and it sounds like it was one of those that. Um for a variety of different reasons, predominantly because of ever-changing market conditions and the change itself, it just wasn't something that came to fruition or ultimately made yeah. it. Could have been one of those things you mentioned, a little bit ahead of its time too. So um, that's always a risk in business. So let's flip that on its head a little bit. I know you've been yep. involved with a number of successful ventures that have really had a dramatic impact on folks. Um, let's, let, let's talk yep. a little bit about, you pick any one of those. Um, like I got to say, I'm, I'm super excited about what we're doing now because, um, it's something that really couldn't be done even, you know, effectively two or three years ago, but there's been a confluence of events that have happened. So what we're doing essentially, um, you know, as I said, we've been helping people kind of navigate the healthcare system. We've been helping them negotiate surprise bills, things like that really for, for, for 25 years. But um, what we're able to do now, bringing this technology to the fore, so we talked about how people don't know that there's this difference in price. And frankly, once it gets above somebody's deductible, people generally don't care because nobody's really connecting that dot back to what's actually coming out of their paycheck every month. Um, but it's been very hard because uh, the people providing the care, primarily you know, hospitals, um, ambulatory surgical centers, providers even, have been very reluctant to share their pricing, right? So everybody kind of wants to keep pricing to themselves. I understand that. And I think that's a totally fair thing to expect where people can shop, when people can actually make decisions uh, on an informed basis. You can't do that in healthcare, at least not until now. So what we're doing is because legislation has started to actually require, so we had to force the hand of the providers to start putting the pricing out there so that people could look at it. They've made it incredibly hard to find the pricing and to use the pricing. And many are choosing not to fully comply and some are choosing not to comply at all. Nonetheless, more data is coming to market. So now we have a chance. Now we're doing two things. Um, and studies have been done showing transparency out there, uh, transparent pricing, what we're talking about, uh, not having a lot of impact because not many people use it. And they couldn't use it because it's hard. And who wants to look up in tables and see this stuff? 
So what we've done is we've benchmarked against the very best shopping apps, shopping capabilities. If you look at your Amazon or your Kayak or your Zillow or um, all those things, even Yelp to a certain degree, right? How you, can you look for things and compare and shop? Bringing that look and feel, which has been around for a few years, but now marrying it with this bigger, ever-growing data set that we're working really hard to pull this data in from the reluctant providers. So people can literally look on their phone, oh, I need to get my shoulder worked on. Um, what does that look like? Who's doing it in my area? And all of a sudden, people are seeing for the first time these eight times differences in price, these two times differences in price, these 10 times difference in price. And from that point on, I think once somebody's actually seen that, seen it apply to them, from that point onward, they're going to demand to really know what the pricing is because now they understand it makes a big difference. And I think that's basically sort of the, it's enabling this sort of grassroots demand for reform that says that the people who are way overcharging and we never knew about it, they don't get to do that anymore. And I think that's going to have a very big impact. So um, you and I have talked about this, and I'm going to take a little bit of an a, a off-the-wall off piece here. Transparency. Yep. Um, what I'm hearing is giving people better knowledge, more transparency, not only in terms of the process, but the prices in this case, arming them with knowledge. And in this case, through technology, you're leveraging, yep. instead of me being able to make a phone call to find out who the best yep. doctor is. And it's funny, you bring up shoulder surgery for my youngest daughter who has her dad's shoulders. Yep. And at the tender age is getting yep. one of hers rebuilt at the end of this year. We're yep. at a little bit of a loss other than the, we do what everybody else does go to who do you best know that is the best shoulder right. guy in Austin. Yep. And then you just kind of take it as, you know, okay, yeah, I trust them. I'm going to go ahead and just do that. And is it a truly the right person? Does it match mm -hmm. up with the particular needs? Um, is it the right price? Is it the right system? Which, by the way, I'm not interested. <clears throat> There's the old joke that goes around about I'm not interested in having um, the doctor that um, is this is his second surgery um, operate on my daughter or right. that is the yeah. Doogie Hauser. Um, he's 15 years <laughs> old and he might be brilliant and that's awesome. Mm -hmm. um, I want somebody that's operating that looks kind of a little bit like me with has no hair because they've been around for a while <laughs> and hopefully they've done this more than a few times. Just yeah. like when you're flying an airplane, it's always a good thing to see an older man or woman that's in the cockpit because they've been there. They've done that. They know what to do in the case yeah. of uh, things going wrong. It's, it's important. It's powerful. It's, it's, it's very, very personal. <clears throat> and what it sounds like what you guys are doing is adding a level of knowledge and transparency to the entire process to force the hand of more efficiency throughout the system. Yep, exactly. You know, if that old system works, which is still the, you know, what everybody does, you go ask somebody who had the procedure, how would you like your doctor? Was it great? Was it, you know, whatever. And you do it. If that actually worked, if that made the economy of medicine efficient, we wouldn't have this radical disparity in quality as well as in price. And you would probably have, I mean, if, if, that, if you had pure transparency all the time, you probably would have people paying more for higher quality. But in healthcare, mm -hmm. because it's not transparent, it is literally... You can't say it's the opposite, but there is no direct correlation between price and quality. Um, there is a tendency toward lower costs going with higher quality, because when you talk about that, that again, we talked at the beginning about people who are super specialized. So that doctor who knows that exact type of procedure that needs to happen on your shoulder um, gets the chance to do that a lot of times. They get a lot of that bats. They get better and better and better at it. And that tends to happen most often in ambulatory surgical setting, uh, settings where they can do that a lot. And those tend to be the lowest cost places to get that procedure done. So there's actually an inverse correlation between price and cost. Hmm. And we see that throughout the throughout kind of the whole system. Uh, sadly, most people can't see that. So people still go with, well, I really liked, you know, my Dr. Joe and uh, I really thought it was great. And yeah, I had to get my shoulder redone three or four times, but he's such a good guy. We had a great time. Well, guess what? No efficiency came from that. Right. So again, the more we can get real transparency or meaningful transparency 
And you know, price transparency without quality transparency doesn't solve the problem, but doing both at the same time, we think is gonna be revolutionary. Meaningful transparency. I say that because I think that is, um, you can have transparency and it can be completely irrelevant. In this case, it is specific, it is detailed, it is spot on with the personal needs and details of patient A or B or whatever else that might be a part of that. Um, that is significant. And it's funny, I'm going back to something you'd mentioned towards the beginning of our conversation about um, you can't talk to doctors outside of your own state um, because of state mm -hmm. guidelines, regulations. Um, and, and it brings to mind uh, medical hacks um, uh, okay. of ways in which people make stuff happen. Um, and it can be as small as um, doing it yourself. Um, never, ever, ever Google a procedure is kind of the, the, the thing, but <laughs> in some cases getting taught yourself, um, to going out of, to a different country for a procedure because mm -hmm. it's either not yeah. approved or part of a, a covered, uh, medically here in the United States. Um, or, mm -hmm. and I'll just frankly mention it, that, um, I have my own medical hack that I have Dr. Jeff. Um, Dr. Jeff does not live in the state of Texas. Um, he was the um, director of all surgical operations at a very, very large uh, healthcare center in a state that begins in F and ends in Florida. Um, and um, <laughs> Dr. Jeff has done an excellent yeah. job of, um, and, and I've literally offered to pay him. I'm like, Dr. Jeff, I want to have you on retainer. He's like, dude, you're a friend. I would just, I would just do this. And I don't do this very often, but it's one of those that if something comes up that I don't want to go through the path of, yeah. It's important enough that I need a decision and I need advice from somebody that's trusted, yeah. but I don't want to enter in the system to go through the rigmarole for something that I might be able to. Anyway, it's just, it's the time value associated with that. And so there's these medical hacks that exist. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not going to call it medicine by TikTok because A, I don't do TikTok, but, and that just scares the unholy bejesus out of me. But mm -hmm. I think that there's people find a way. And those folks that might be living on an income of 40,000 or 50,000 or 20,000 that can't afford insurance, but they need okay. stuff done. How do we take care of them versus how do we take care of folks that are part of the system that are paying their way, that are doing it. And they might have a tight budget or they have an infinite budget. Uh, or they could, they have a lot of uh, freestanding cash that they could afford these. You've got a, such a variety of different mix of different folks that are part of the equation. Yep. And with, what is it now? 8 billion people on the planet. We've got 8 billion yeah. different individual issues that are particular to each individual story. So it just yeah. becomes one of those. Uh, um, I'm not sure what the answer is as it pertains mm -hmm. to it. I know that there are answers. There are better ways. It sounds like you guys at Point Health are taking a good approach on the transparency side associated with that. Which leads me to kind of my next question, which is. It's 2023. Let's jump ahead three years. Mm -hmm. Putting on your visioneering hat. What has Point Health done with this level of transparency to small way or large way radically change the marketplace? What does that look like? Well, there's a few things. Um, one, I hope that we'll start driving again that grassroots demand for change. Right? There's no reason why the same procedure at the same quality, let alone worse quality, should cost three, four, five times more. Um, and if there's transparency, that will that will stop. And I think that will remove a lot of cost, a lot of excess unnecessary cost from the system. Um, you know, two is you know one thing we do now because. Again, people uh, really generally don't care what happens above their deductible for the most part. And I think it's good to help educate people why they should care and get them engaged in it. It's one thing to get them to care. It's another thing to make it easy for them to do something with that. So we're working on the easy part. We hope everybody starts working on the care part or, or on you know why they, why they should put the effort in. Um, and the third thing is because of what we do, we work with a lot of people who, who do have a lot of skin in the game on, on what they're spending. Right. So the early adopters of our technology are people who are working with, you know, they can't afford the ACA costs. So they might be using um, a limited benefit plan. They might be using 
uh, a discount medical plan. They might be using a health sharing organization. There's lots of different ways that we can finance healthcare rather than this one single way. And right now, the, the, the effort uh, being driven out there from the top down is to force everything to be nothing but the ACA plan, which we know doesn't isn't viable without subsidy. So if we, my hope is that that flexibility is going to open up so that different types of plans can be tried and used. And we can actually look at the data and the results from each one of those and see, are there different ways that we can organize around getting people care that can provide the care at a lower cost and do so successfully and easier and a better experience for everybody. Um, if we try to mandate a single solution, we won't get that variety of choices. We won't get that experimentation that's going to get us to a better solution that will make it viable for everyone. So I love a couple of things about that. And again, it comes back to flexibility, openness, transparency, and providing optionality. I mean, and it's really, how do you, how do you figure out how to make people, not make, but give people the opportunity, leveraging technology to make better choices that impact them as directly and as specifically as possible um, with their health. And that leads to my last question of the day, um, which is directly tied in to kind of what we've been talking about through this whole medical technology component piece and your expertise and the things that you've experienced are spot on. Thank you for sharing. Um, our live cast is called Humanizing Software. We've been doing it now for going on almost two years. Um, our subtitle, however, is something that seems to be quite, quite interesting to a lot of folks. It's three words. It's people driven tech. I have asked this question of every one of my previous guests. I'd love to get your take when you hear those three words, people driven tech, Doug, what comes to mind from your side? To me, it's about solving the real everyday problems that your average person has. And in my world, you know, those tend to be members, members of health plans. We talk about being member centric in everything you do. How do you make sure that what you're doing is always improving their experience with the healthcare system from a cost perspective, from a customer experience perspective, from a uh, outcomes perspective, um, every step of the way. So using the tech to do that, to leverage it is key. Um, there's, you know, I mentioned earlier, it's hard for organizations to invest heavily in people because they don't get the risk benefit downstream. And um, which makes me pause in my generally pro-market approach to say, well, is a single payer the way to go? Because then the risk really is completely longitudinal. Then there's somebody there who should be investing early on to keep the risks down below because the government always has that risk. And my big pause on that is this need for constant innovation. And do we lose that with a monolithic entity? But if we have lots and lots of different companies, as we do here in the United States, working on different ways to solve this problem, we're going to have a breakthrough here, a breakthrough there, and maybe some mega breakthroughs that really change the system for everybody. But it only does that if it's organized around how do we make that patient's life better. So if I am reading between the lines, the most important part of that is A, keeping people at the center of the equation, and B, how do we make their lives better? And in this case, it involves the technology aspect along with choices, optionality, flexibility, putting together the ecosystem that enables Doug Bain or Andrew Tull and their families to make the right decisions for what enables them to have their best version of themselves living their longest life possible. Is that yep. fair? And, and, and trying new things in parts of that Constantly that. experimenting, learning, sharing those results and those outcomes so they can be replicated elsewhere. Experimenting, learning, and sharing. That might be the tagline of the day while working to make folks better. And that is a perfect 
stopping point for us today, Doug. I want to thank you for joining us in today's conversation. Um, very, very much so. You have been a dear friend for, I can't even remember, since I think the day before I was born. Um, <laughs> and I'm blessed to have you in my life. Thank you for what you've shared in so many different ways. And as we finish up on today's conversation, we want to make sure that we have the opportunity um, to ask folks. And I see we've got some comments from some folks that have come in um, that we'll be addressing on LinkedIn and in our uh, 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 YouTube channel. We'll be addressing other questions. We'll be keeping this conversation going. But please visit our website at tailwindsw.com. Follow us on our YouTube channel. Let's have these conversations about experimenting, about learning, about taking those items and sharing them with others to enable us to leverage technology, people-driven technology, to make lives better for other folks. We look forward to our conversation next week with Randy Merriweather. Again, Doug, thank you today for your time. And as we close out today, we want to wish everybody a very, very good morning, a good afternoon, and good evening. Thanks again for sharing your time with us. Thanks, Andrew. Have a great day, everybody.